back up and pivot and uh, real talk. Rob talked about last week how, as followers of Jesus, as the church, we're supposed to um, be submitted to the authorities over us. And we are supposed to pray for those who are in authority over us. And, uh, and yes, we recognize Jesus as our ultimate king and the kingdom of heaven as our ultimate kingdom, but we do want to pray for those that are in authority. And so, in an effort to practice what we preached, Last week, we want to start as a church, actually, we want to start, we just want to take a moment to pray for our president and first lady with the recent news we have received. So I would invite you guys, before we get into the sermon, to pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. And uh, thank, you that, uh, thank you that we're part of a kingdom that um, transcends, that sub, it's subversive, but over, also overarching, and it, it transcends the kingdoms of the, this earth. But Lord, we're also involved in the kingdoms of this earth. And I think sometimes when we think about missions, we think about going overseas somewhere. But Lord, no, this country we live in, this is our mission field. This is where you have placed us. Uh, it's not an accident that we were born here. And so, Lord, may we demonstrate love for the people, for our communities, for our states, for our countries, and, and, and for our leaders. And so to do that, Lord, we come to you now, and we ask for, for healing for President Trump. Um, <clears throat> we ask for healing for the First Lady. We ask for healing for um, whoever else in the White House may have it or, 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 or contract it. Lord, we just pray for a healing and um, for a mighty work. And may we be persistent in prayer for our leaders. And may we practice what we preach as a church. Because we will not have credibility with our community or our states or our government if we do not pray for our authorities and set an example in doing that. So we pray for them now. We pray for healing. And Lord, we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 5, and we've been here for a little bit. <clears throat> and if you're following along, we're going to be in Acts 5, 33 through 42. Now, that's the passage. Let me set the scene for you, okay? Because the scene we have today, it's going to be very storytelly today. We've got a courtroom drama. Anyone like to watch, like, courtroom drama shows? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, a couple. Okay, now, who feels like they could be a lawyer based on watching those courtroom shows? Just me? Okay, there's just me then, right? Object, Your Honor! That's the only thing I know. And so we have a courtroom scene today. Who's on trial? We actually have this disciple of Jesus named Peter on trial. And this is Peter and some of the apostles, these early followers of Jesus. They, uh, they're actually called the way, the way of Jesus. We have these early followers of Jesus who had actually eyewitnessed everything Jesus did and who had been commissioned by Jesus to go and make disciples and to teach them to obey. And they've been commissioned in Acts chapter one to be a witness to Jesus, an eyewitness to Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth. We'll get to that. And so that's who's on trial, this group of early Jesus followers. <laughs> and uh, these guys are petulant because they're on trial for teaching the name of Jesus, proclaiming the name of Jesus, trying to inspire others to follow Jesus for the third time. They won't stop. It's like they proclaim the name of Jesus, put on trial. Okay, sorry. Now, sorry. Proclaim the name of Jesus, get put on trial. Then they get out. Proclaim the name of Jesus, now they're on trial again. They won't stop. They're insistent and incessant. Now, who has them on trial? Well, let's, uh, let's talk about it. It's this group of religious rulers named the Sanhedrin. Now, in your Bibles, you'll see it will say the elders of the people. Okay, well, the Sanhedrin is more specific. The Sanhedrin was this group of religious rulers, and it was 71 elders of the people. They were priests and scribes and teachers of the law. And this is interesting to know. This same group of people that would kind of uh, demonstrate it as like a court, and they would adjudicate over religious matters. This is the same group that put Jesus on trial. Uh, listen to this. Eight weeks earlier, scholars think. And I think sometimes when we read the book of Acts, we're like, well, there's the Gospels and the story of Jesus. Then you got Acts. No! The book of Acts is like right after the Gospels. This is eight weeks after Jesus was on trial. This is the same group. And of course they put the followers of Jesus on trial because they're like, we thought we snuffed this thing out with Jesus. Now y'all going around telling everybody about Jesus. Ugh. Now, the Sanhedrin were made up of two primary groups. I need you to know a couple things for stuff later on to make sense. There's a group called the Sadducees and a group called the Pharisees. The Sadducees, think of it, I know these are political times, but the best illustration is like Democrats and Republicans, okay? In our government, you have Democrats and Republicans. In the Sanhedrin, in the Jewish faith, you had Sadducees and Pharisees. The Sadducees were the majority party. 
But the Sadducees were looked down upon by the Pharisees because they were called sellouts. Because in this day, you need to know this for later, this empire ruled the world called Rome and they oppressed the Jewish people and told them what to do. And sometimes it would even coax them into worshiping false gods. And so the people of Israel didn't like Rome, but the Sadducees were kind of in cahoots with Rome. They were kind of uh, scheming with Rome and they would get paid by Rome and they would often be found compromising their beliefs to follow Rome. So the Pharisees didn't like the Sadducees. Now the Pharisees, mm, these guys are more like purists. They really stuck to the letter of the law and the Old Testament. But interesting enough, as I was doing some research this week, they shared a lot of beliefs with the early followers of Jesus, early followers of the way of Jesus. And one in particular that you need to know for today, we won't exhaust the list, they believed in the sovereignty of God. They believed that God was working in and through every single event to bring about his good plans, purposes, and promises. God was writing the story of humanity and everything was moving towards his ultimate end. And people get to be a part of that and events transpire to get there. They believe in the sovereignty of God, his plan, his story working out. Okay, so give me a head nod if that makes sense to you. Give me a head nod. There we go, I like it. So the Sanhedrin had the early followers of Jesus on trial. Now here's what happened last week. The disciples are told, quit preaching the name of Jesus. And the disciples are like, yeah, we're all set. We're gonna go ahead and do that anyway. Because <laughs> uh, we have to obey God rather than man. We've been called to make disciples and to be a witness. So um, uh, sorry, not sorry. See something, say something. We've seen stuff. We're going to go ahead and just uh, keep doing what we do. And then they press in a little bit and they tell the uh, Sanhedrin, they go, oh yeah, also don't think we forgot what y'all did to Jesus. Don't, don't act like we don't remember what you did to Jesus. We remember and we tell people about it. Well, the Sanhedrin didn't, or sorry, the um, Sanhedrin didn't really like this. So let's see what happens next. When they, the Sanhedrin, heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. This is an incredibly intense word in Greek. Don't have time to go into it. They were enraged and wanted to kill them. Now, here we go. We're going to see a lot of plot twists today. And this is the first one. Given the context and the auspices of this situation, things are not going well in this courtroom trial for the followers of Jesus. And we would expect a one of three things to happen. Either the disciples will um, be imprisoned, either the disciples will be beaten or flogged, or the disciples will be killed. And so this, this tension starts to amass, this tension arises. It's like, they're really mad, they have the power to actually say like, we're gonna kill you or imprison you or beat you. And so the disciples are probably over here going like, all right, bro, I don't know what the ruling is, but it's not, it's not gonna be good, okay? Like, this isn't gonna go well for us, so like, let's just get ready for it. And think about in a movie, you know when there's like this violin sound and there's like that high pitch, like tense moment, right? All of a sudden, a voice resounds from the back of the room, men of Israel. And everyone goes, huh, huh, who, who said that? Now the Sanhedrin, they believe, sat in either a semicircle or a complete circle. And so here's how I like to picture it in my head. We have over here, we have the Sanhedrin, right? Pharisees and Sadducees. Over here, we have... The, we have Peter and the apostles of Jesus awaiting adjudication. But then, I almost picture this dude like at the back of the room who stands up and he's like, hey, I got something to say. Say, say, say. And the dude who stands up isn't just any dude. He's this guy named Gamaliel. Gamaliel. If you're uh, expecting a child, maybe go with that name. That's a dope name. That's free. You're welcome. Gamaliel. And Gamaliel isn't just some dude. He is the dude. He is a famous teacher of the law. He's a famous rabbi. He was lauded and respected by everyone present. When he stood up, everyone went, whoa, 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 shh, 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 shh. He got something to say. And this, this will factor in later, and, and we'll talk about it again later. But Gamaliel was a famous Pharisee. And so you can imagine as he steps before the council, it's like his footsteps have weight to them. They've got clout to them. And everyone's like, oh snap, what's he gonna say? And he starts walking up. Now, quick sidebar, if you'll join me here. One interesting thing about Gamaliel is he has a young pupil named Saul, 
who we will hear about in a couple weeks. Um, later on in the book of Acts, he, Saul will go by his Greek name. He doesn't change his name. He goes by his Greek name, Paul, the Apostle Paul. Was a student of Gamaliel, one of the most famous rabbis of the day. Okay, dude had clout. Gamaliel stands up. This is what he says. A Pharisee in the council in Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, <clears throat> held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And then he said, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. So Gamaliel dismisses the people on trial. He's like, uh, let's, uh, let, the, let the adults talk, okay? You guys go ahead and go back. Let the adults talk. Thank you. Good. And so Gamaliel is getting ready to get into it. Now, one, before we look at what he says, I want to just kind of make one more point so you understand the situation, you understand the clout that Gamaliel has. Imagine, let's turn the story this way. Imagine you guys are the Sanhedrin, okay? Imagine I'm on trial. And all of a sudden, the back doors burst open, and Rob McDowell, our lead pastor, was like, stop right there, young man. Everyone would go, oh, snap, Rob. Like, he just interrupted him. Everyone would like, like, turn their heads and watch. And be like, slow it down, youngster. It's enough out of you. And you guys would watch Rob probably take every step down the aisle because you'd be like, oh, because Rob is my elder. Rob's got that clout of lead pastor. So there's some weight in the room and there's some weight to what he would say next. And so Gamaliel says, hey, take care of what you're going to do, dismisses them. And then here's what Gamaliel says. He's going to, like a lawyer, present a case with exhibit A and with exhibit B. So let's see what exhibit A is. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. So let me tell you about a boy, Thutis. Thutis was a Jewish revolutionary. He tried to lead revolts against Rome, the superpower of the day. He, and he, he did so thinking he had some kind of divine calling to do it. Almost like he fancied himself like a Messiah of Israel. And he amassed this following, hoping to overthrow Rome. <laughs> now, um, he was killed, but he was, not before he embarrassed himself. There's a, this historical account where Thutis came to the Jordan River, and Thutis, fancying himself to be the new Moses, turns his back to try to part the Jordan River, and he's like, Jordan River, part! And nothing happens. Have you ever tried to do a magic trick and like pull a coin out from someone's, behind someone's ear, and you just drop it, and you're like, oh, snap, sorry. Um, that's kind of what happens, and everyone's like, this joke or this clown, and he's like, no, guy, where are you going? No, 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 I, pr I promise I'll do it, I'll do it. Part! No, no, guys, guys! And it's this embarrassing situation for him. He loses his calling, ends up getting, or his following ends up getting killed. It doesn't go well for him. So Gamaliel is presenting this case to the Sanhedrin, and, the, and he's like, remember Thutis? Remember Thuti? Our guy Thuti? Remember? Yeah, that flopped. That's exhibit A. Now, what is he doing here? He's likening Thutis, this guy who's a failed revolutionary, failed movement, he's likening them, him to the disciples hmm, and the apostles. So let's see exhibit B. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people. After him, he too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So there's a couple guys, three specifically named Judas, that rose up who also fancied themselves revolutionaries and tried to lead a revolt against Rome, the ruling empire of the day. And they fancied themselves to have this divine calling and kind of be like a messiah. And Judas actually helped start this movement called the Zealots. So for Bible nerds in the room, you know that the Zealots were one of the Jewish classes in the first century. That started with Judas, and he thought he could go up against Rome and overthrow Rome because God was on his side. And if God's on our side, who can stand against us? Well, he too perished. Didn't go well for our boy Judas, and all of his followers were scattered. So that's, um, that's exhibit B. So recap, Gamaliel, say you guys are the sun, he and he's like, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have exhibit A, Thutis, nothing happened there. Uh, exhibit B, um, Judas, uh, nothing happened there. I'm not that worried about these guys. Do you see his logic? Do you see what he's getting at? He's trying to show these failed cases. So then he comes to this conclusion. Verse 38, so in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and just leave them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. So here's Gamaliel's 
his approach. Remember Thudy? Remember Judy? Remember Thudy and Judy? Yeah, flopped, okay? Totally flopped, fell off, dissipated. Don't worry about these guys, they're gonna fall off. So uh, by that, he just thinks that early movement of Jesus is just going to just be a phase. He thinks it's just gonna fizzle out. So, so let me illustrate this to you. Real quick, how many people in the room have kids? Who has kids? Okay, and for those of you who don't, brave people, those of you who don't, you probably know some kids, have nieces, nephews, whatever. You know that sometimes kids get really hopped up and hyped up, right? And if you haven't experienced this, guess what? Halloween's coming, okay? You, you finna learn. And sometimes kids, if they have too much candy, you know, their eyes dilate and they get that like big black shark eye, you know? And they like don't blink for five minutes. They're like, candy, I like candy, I want candy, I want more candy, did this candy, all, all colors of candy, chocolate candy, chewy candy. And they kind of have that sugar rush. And what do you have to do? Just let them run around. Just let them fizzle out. And they're just kind of like, I got so much energy. I gotta go, gotta go, go, gotta go, gotta go. And it's like, okay, honey, just let him, just he'll tucker himself out. He'll wear himself out. This is kind of Gamaliel's approach to the movement of Jesus. Like, they're just gonna tire themselves out. Or if you have a kid, you know, kids go through phases, right? Sometimes they're like super into this and they're super into that. Maybe you have a kid who likes to wear cowboy boots and a diaper and like a red cape. And he likes to go to Kroger like that. Well, as a parent, you know, that's just a phase. And hopefully you won't have a 30-year-old son who goes to Kroger one day wearing cowboy boots and a diaper and a red cape, being like, what's up, everybody? How's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Like, no, it's just a phase. That's what Gamaliel thought the movement of Jesus was. Probably just a phase. That's why he's making and constructing this argument. But then check this out. He leaves kind of the door cracked. He says, but... If it, this Jesus movement, is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So remember, Gamaliel is part of this group called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees believed in the sovereignty of God. God working in and through everything, bringing about his ultimate means and end. And so he kind of leaves the door open and he says, but I mean... If this is of God, we don't want to oppose them. Kind of like we don't want to be on the wrong side of history. We don't want to be against God if he's actually for this. But my argument would be he doesn't really think this. He's just kind of leaving the door open. Because what was his case? Two failed movements. These guys are a failed movement. Just let them go. They're harmless. And so that's his ruling. And we'll get to this at the end. But this turns out to be incredibly ironic. So as we round out this portion of the narrative... We have seen um, some plot twists so far. We think that maybe something bad's gonna happen to the disciples, but boom, in comes Gamaliel, plot twist. And he actually says, go ahead and let him go. Now at this point, if he says let him go, we would expect that the Sanhedrin are gonna let him go. Plot twist, that's not what happens. Verse 40, this is what happens. And they had called in the apostles, oh, sorry. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. So we're thinking the disciples are gonna go, Scott's free, like we're good to go. No, first they are beaten. Now I need to, to create some drama here. The word beat here is this word dero in Greek. And it actually means to be flogged, to be whipped. And actually the, the literal connotation is to be skinned. And it's because they used these whips that were leather and they had little shards of like rocks or like glass or whatever in them. And when they would whip you with them, they'd wrap around and sometimes it would pull flesh off. And in this culture and tradition, what, what they did a lot of times is they would give you this, this flogging called the 40 minus one. They believed 40 lashes would kill you. And so to not kill you, they'd be like 40 lashes minus one. We're just gonna get you right to the point of death. And so that's, they beat down these early followers of Jesus, almost like skinning them. And so please hear this. The disciples, Peter and the apostles, should be on the brink of death. So what would we expect here? We'd expect them to probably limp home, like probably just uh, disheartened, maybe like just hurting, and they're probably just gonna go home, lay down. Who knows if they'll proclaim the name of Jesus again? Doesn't seem likely. And they're going to be discouraged and disheartened and in pain. Maybe tears. Well, plot twist. That's not what happens. Because here's what it says in the next verse. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing. They were rejoicing. What? 
that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Think of how frustrated the Sanhedrin are. The Sanhedrin are probably like, I mean, we're just going to go ahead and flog them to the point of death. That'll shut them up. And the apostles end up rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be, to be dishonored and hurt for the name of Jesus. This had to be exhausting. And the early movement of Jesus, it was kind of petulant like this. They had this persistent joy they had this relentless zeal for Jesus in the way of Jesus that they're like, go ahead. What, what, do you want us to come back? We're going to go proclaim the name more. You want us to come back and we'll schedule this for next week? By analogy, um, I have a brother, and I have two brothers, but one of my brothers growing up was very petulant. He would like just goad my parents into, <laughs> into conflict. And I don't want to say his name, so we'll just say his name is Jeff, okay? So Jeff. Actually, that is his name. His name is Jeff, okay? <laughs> and Jeff would like trash talk my parents. They'd be like, Jeff, I see you eating those Flintstone vitamins like candy. Some of us have been there. Uh, do you want, you want a timeout or you want spanking? And he would literally go, I'll take spanking. And like, he's just talking trash. He's like, let's do this. And my parents are very moderate and they're very calculated in how they disciplined. So they would almost be confused like, uh, okay. And so my brother Jeff would like trash talk. He'd be like, oh, is that it? That, oh, that's it? Oh, I thought these were supposed to hurt. Did someone leave a window open or did you spank me yet? You know what I mean? Or like, hey dad, no wonder your golf game's trash. Your back swing's broke, dude. Like, let's go, step into it. Like, I got all day. I got nowhere to be, go ahead. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I'm, I'm a kid. I don't have like a business meeting to get to, go ahead. And he was just petulant. That's how the early followers of Jesus were. They're like, bring it. Completely frustrating and flustering to the Sanhedrin. And then, let's go ahead. What do we expect next? Okay, they're rejoicing, but they're probably gonna go ahead. The apostles are gonna leave, and they're probably just gonna go ahead and just like chill for a while and lay low and recalculate and recalibrate and get it together, circle the wagons. Right? You know what's going on? Plot twist, that's not what happens at all. Let's see what happens next. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Messiah is Jesus. How exhausting for the Sanhedrin. They can't stop, won't stop. They go, they're probably like, oh, like my ribs are showing. I gotta like just go ahead and tape those up and then like go ahead and start telling people about Jesus again. They're relentless. Now I wanna point to this word, preaching. It's this word in Greek, euangelizo, it is a verb, and it means to announce good news, but this is specific, so I want to tell you the content of their message that's bothering everybody. The content of their message was the Old Testament, realized they didn't have a New Testament, they would talk about the Old Testament and how Jesus was the fulfillment of all God's promises and purposes and plans of the Old Testament. They would often say, hey, remember Moses? We'll see this again in about two weeks. Remember Moses? Yeah, Jesus is the new Moses. Remember David? Yeah, Jesus is like the new David, the fulfillment of the Davidic line. Remember what all those things the prophets said? Yeah, Jesus fulfilled those. And they would use the Old Testament to point to Jesus and then talk about the teachings and the way of Jesus. And this was the good news that they would proclaim. And they would tell everyone, your sins can be forgiven. If you just repent and turn, you can be made new in Jesus. No more breaking your back with guilt and just striving. No, you can be made new in Jesus. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And that's exactly what they preached, the gospel. But here's the thing. That's kind of the religious connotation, religious content. Gospel also had political implications. Because the word for gospel in Greek was used to talk about Caesar, the ruler of the Roman Empire. So every time Caesar would have a major victory, they would say, hey, we've got some gospel, some good news for you about Caesar. Every time a new Caesar came to power, they'd go, hey, we have good news for you. There's a new Caesar in power. And they would print his name on, on banners and they'd mint it on a coin and say, son of God and Caesar is Lord. And the early church picked up on this language and they're like, eh, yeah, but like also um, the good news is that Jesus is king and Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is the son of God. And so that was part of the good news that they were proclaiming that will be a bigger deal in the later chapters of Acts. And so they just keep on with this gospel message, which is beautiful. So as we wrap this up here, this is what I like to call one of the most iconic and ironic passages in all of Scripture. Because let's go back to our boy Gamaliel. Gamaliel said, remember his argument, if it's of man, it'll fail. However, 
if it is of God, we will not be able to overthrow it. And we don't want to be in opposition to God. But Gamaliel, given the evidence of Thudi and Judy, he believed in the sovereignty of God, but he thought the sovereignty of God was going to go his way. And he didn't think this, this petty group of people was going to do anything. Plot twist. This is the great irony. It was of God. This Jesus movement, the way of Jesus in his early church was of God. That's the ironic thing. Gamaliel, our boy, was right and he didn't even know it. He had this unwitting wisdom about the church. And guess what? After this passage and throughout the rest of the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament and the rest of church history and even today, the, G the way of Jesus, the movement of Jesus in his church has not been stopped. It's the unstoppable move of Jesus. And I get in my feels when I preach this and that's why I'm a pastor because I believe it. And so throughout time, as time has unfolded, we can read accounts. You can read this uh, historian, Eusebius, and he writes about the second and third century. They persecuted Christians. Oh no, didn't, didn't phase them. They just kept going. Oh no, and then, and then even in the, the Middle Ages, things got kind of off, off track. Doesn't matter, the church persisted. And throughout time and history, the church moved from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It went up into Europe, it went over to Russia, it went down to Africa, and there was an early movement of the Ethiopian and Ethiopian and Coptic churches came over to America. It's gone out to all the corners of the world. It was of God. And the church still, the way of Jesus and his church still remains, still persists, and still endures today. And in this is a tribute to the sovereignty of God. Just like Gamaliel believed in the sovereignty of God and his provision for his church. And the church here in our community and worldwide and throughout history stands as not only a movement, but a monument to the faithfulness of God. And so I want to invite you into something today. I want to invite you to pivot your perspective on the way of Jesus and his church. I think sometimes we get a narrow view. We view ourselves as individuals, separate entities. That's not the way the church has ever worked. You are part of something bigger. And so one of my favorite things to do is to widen the lens for people. And I want you to see this story that the Lord has been writing in this movement that could have gotten snuffed out with Jesus, could have been snuffed out in this courtroom trial, has not been able to be stopped because it is of God and his sovereignty and providence. And the Lord has preserved and procured and, and perpetuated his church. And uh, I was talking to a friend the other day and I was telling him, I was teaching today, and he doesn't go here, and he's like, oh, what you, what you teaching about? I'm like, well, long story, but um, uh, I kind of told him some details, and he was like, you know how look people give you, and they go, oh, yeah, okay, okay. And you're thinking to yourself, like, yeah, they don't get it, okay. <laughs> and so I was like, I need to simplify it, and I just go, I want tomorrow to be a pep rally for the church. That's what I want it to be. I want to invigorate the church and instill confidence and excitement and a sense of celebration about this thing the Lord has created and given us, that the way of Jesus and his church still stands. And so I want to, right though? And so I want to talk to two groups of people, followers of Jesus in this room. Perhaps you have felt lately a little detached from church. In COVID season, that's normal. Maybe you felt a little apathetic towards church. I don't know, hell King Jesus. Um, I don't know, I'm just, I got stuff going on, other stuff on my mind, stuff I'm thinking about. I'm just kind of, mm, I don't really feel it like I used to feel it. Uh, maybe you're feeling a little fatigued. Maybe you've served in church for years, and even in COVID, you're like, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? And you're kind of getting burned out, and you're like, man, I just need to, I need to take a break for a minute. Let me invite you today. If you find yourself in those places, let me just tell you, it's okay to feel that way. You can go through a season of fatigue or disheartenment or detachment in the church. That's totally okay. And we see you, and you're allowed to feel that way. And we're here for you. But let me invite you to pivot your perspective on the way of Jesus and his church. And let me invite you into the bigger story. I think when we start viewing ourselves as individual entities, 
we kind of lose some potency. I think sometimes if we come here expecting to kind of consume a product, or if we come here expecting to kind of spectate an event, we miss it. I want to invite you today to widen your lens and see the bigger story you're a part of. See God's sovereignty and providence and faithfulness in this thing that you get to be a part of. It's a monument and a movement, and you're part of it. And you might know things cognitively, and maybe you learned some things about church history today and, and the proliferation of the church, but I want you to feel, I want you to kind of feel it here today. And I hope to kind of stir your affections for the way of Jesus and his church. And we need you. And let me, let me exhort you with this. You are part of the greatest movement in human history for the good of this world and the glory of God and preparation of his kingdom. You're a part of that. Get hyped for that. And so that is my encouragement to you today and my invitation to you today. And yes, churches always have reforms they have to go through, always have awakenings they have to go through. But the Lord in his kindness through the leading of the Holy Spirit has always brought those about in due time. To you followers of Jesus, however, in the room, who um, might hear this and go, I mean, but for real though? I've kind of always just kind of faithfully followed. I'm not trying to flex. Like, that's I just, honestly, I've just always followed. Rob and I were talking about this this week. <laughs> let, me, let me say something we actually don't do a lot in church. If you feel like you've faithfully followed and you've faithfully served the church and been involved for many years, let me say this. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's amazing. Let me say thank you. This church is built on the backs of faithful followers of Jesus. The church has been built on the backs of faithful followers of Jesus. We help in the process. We join the story of building the church and, and bringing forward the way of Jesus. So if you've done that, well done. And let me encourage you to take heart and be encouraged in these times of uncertainty, especially around the church. But to you people in the room or watching on NMC Plus, who aren't followers of Jesus, or who are kind of just checking it out, or maybe you lost a bet and they're like, okay, I gotta go to church now. Let me, let me hit you up real quick. So, I'm a millennial, I'm 33, and I know that younger, research has said younger Gen X people, millennials, and older Gen Z people who may be hearing this, they have an aversion to <laughs> formalized, and institutionalized religious institutes, <laughs> or formal religious institutes. Uh, formal religious institutes? Real talk, I'm not into that. That sounds really boring. A formalized religious institution. I've had friends over the years who aren't followers of Jesus go, aren't you kind of religious? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. That sounds super boring. Let me tell you what I am. I am a faithful and enthusiastic follower of Jesus. I'm not part of a religious institution. I am part of the greatest movement in human history for the good of this world, the glory of God, and the preparation of his kingdom. That's what I'm a part of. I don't know about y'all. That's what I'm a part of. And the church has always been on the front lines when it comes to caring for orphans. I don't have time to go into it, but it's my favorite thing to talk about. The church has always been on the front lines of bringing medical missions overseas. They've been on the front lines, do your research, on modern education. The church helped start that. The church has always been on the front lines of social issues and moving towards the oppressed and helping the oppressed, and we always should. And the church has been part of speaking good news to people and grace to people, and not every religious movement does that. This is a movement of God, and it has stood and continues to. And so if you're here, and you're asking yourself, well, hold up, there's other religions that have lasted a while. Okay, fair. Most not as long as the church. And many of the ones you're probably thinking of are derivations of the church, or cult spinoffs, that do not hold up. Let me be just real talk, real fast. Had a short period of my life where I began to actively doubt. I started questioning my faith and what I believed. And I gave myself the permission to. And I explored and I studied and I read and I taught to people. And it didn't take long, honestly. And I came back to the way of Jesus and his church. Not that I really stepped away per se, because it is the most beautiful and compelling 
and historically accurate and logically sound and philosophically salient and ethically solid way of living in this world. And it's not even close. That's why I follow Jesus. That of billions of reasons. And so that's why I have faith. And it's not blind faith as in like, I think it's real. No, faith in that I have allegiance and deep devotion to Jesus, the way of Jesus in his church. And so if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus or you're kind of on the fence, let me invite you to maybe just take, I'm big on this, take just a step to maybe join the movement. I've talked to people that have moments when they decide to follow Jesus. This is the moment I knew. And I've talked to other people that say, I kind of just started going to church. I kind of just started learning about Jesus. I kind of just started falling in love with Jesus and the way of Jesus. And it just kind of happened. And then eventually they get to celebrate that and make a commitment to Jesus through baptism like we're having next service. And so if you're there today and you're like, I don't know if it's a moment or just want to join, then join the movement. Take a step in. And hey, if it's of man, the church will fold and fail. But it, if it is of God, it will stand. And so I want to invite you, speaking of standing, I want to invite you to stand. And I like to, uh, if you ever heard me teach, I like to uh, end real old school. And I like to offer a benediction. This is a good word. This is a tradition that's been in the church for years and years and years and years and years. And I want to offer you a benediction to speak a blessing and a good word over you. So may you today pivot your perspective on the church. May you realize that you are part of a bigger story. May you have your lens widened. May you look back on history and see God's providence and sovereignty and procuring and protecting and proliferating and preparing his church. And may you realize that this way of Jesus and this expression of his church has undergone persecution, seeming ir irrelevance and obscurity, has overcome movements between kings and nations and political parties, has survived pestilence and plague and every social movement and new orders and new worldviews and societal shifts and cultural changes. And it still stands and still remains and still persists and still endures today. So to, may today be a pep rally for you. May today be the encouragement that you needed. And may the Holy Spirit enliven us as we sing this next song to build our lives on the way of Jesus because it's not going anywhere. Grace and peace to you.